One? The, oh, you made it halfway? Oh, and then you, uh, they hauled you out or what? You just, or you just went from the bottom up and then back down? Oh, <laughs> that's the best hike, in my opinion, in the state of Utah. It's a good hike, isn't it? It was really a lot of fun. I, I recommend it. So if you haven't done it, sometime take some time and go down and do it. It's a great hike. Well, I don't have a lot of prepared remarks for this. I thought I'd talk just about a little bit about the venture capital uh, uh, arena as we see it. Uh, let me describe Desert Mutual a little bit so you know kind of what kind of the viewpoint that I have of this whole arena. Uh, uh, Desert Mutual is the employee benefits arm of the LDS Church. So we do the employee benefits for uh, uh, all of the related organizations to the church. Single employer trust. So Everything, every person that we deal with has to work for a company that is controlled and owned by the LDS Church in some way. So we, we work for uh, you know, the church employees themselves, but Brigham Young University and the other campuses are also the people that we work with. Uh, from my view of the company, I'm a little bit different because we're an employee benefits company, and so we do the health benefits. We actually process health claims and all of that kind of stuff. We've kind of been in the forefront. As a matter of fact, our president, who just got called to another assignment. He's down in Argentina right now as a mission president. But he, he, was, he uh, went back before Congress as this whole health care debate thing was going on and testified before Congress. We're in a kind of a unique position because we're a private insurance company, but we're not in the business of making money. Even though we're a for-profit organization, technically, structurally, we don't make money. And uh, so we really just are there to service this one group of people. So you'd almost consider us a subsidiary uh, uh, of that organization, and which actually, I guess, technically we are. Uh, the, my view of the company, though, even though health care is the predominant part of the employee headcount, is on the financial benefits of, uh, of the company. We offer uh, def both defined contribution and defined benefit retirement plans. So the biggest pot of money that we manage is a, is a little over $3 billion that we manage for a defined benefit retirement plan. So it's got a long-term time horizon. We have the opportunity to invest in a lot of different things. One of the areas that we invest in is the private equity markets, which includes the venture capital area, uh, i.e., you know, things that you people are learning a little bit about, I would think. Uh, we also do a lot in the public markets and, and, and that type of thing. Um, my specific responsibilities are top down looking for areas of opportunity within the different asset classes and stuff like that. I, I, I do not pick individual bonds anymore. I leave that to other members of my staff. But I really look at it from a macro and from a framework structure stand, structural standpoint. So that's kind of my background. Now, how have I dealt with uh, now? Someone defined for me entrepreneurship. You guys are in this program. They didn't have a program like this when I went through school. And I won't even tell you when that was because that will date me way back when. We'll just tell you it was in the 70s. So uh, somebody out there defined for me what, what is entrepreneurship? I'm going to let you guys ask questions, but I'm going to ask them first. What are you learning? Somebody be verbal. There you go. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of different classes that we take <clears throat> that run us along kind of mm -hmm. the phases of businesses. Mm -hmm. So is that, how many of you have visions right now that you're going to go out and probably get involved in a startup company at some point in the not too distant future, in the next decade or so? Raise them high. I'm just curious. Pretty much everybody, that's why you're, most people, that's why you're kind of in that, in, in this arena? Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting and dynamic uh, proposition. I was talking to some students upstairs, some undergraduate students, and, and uh I honestly think that one of the strengths of the United States of America right now, one thing that we're still extremely competitive at, is the nature of our capital markets. Uh, we are kind of a little bit the wild, wild west still, in, in the sense that uh, people are very open and free thinking and capital will be driven to where some great ideas are. And, uh, and even though it's been a little challenging the last few years, we're just starting to see that really open up again. And uh, there's a lot of people focused on that area. Uh, as a matter of fact, just as a side note, there is uh, some legislation. One of the problems with uh, venture capital is uh, 
that it hasn't been uh, democratized yet. Now let me define that term as I, as I see it. Uh, I don't know how many, I don't know if you've followed the, <clears throat> excuse me, the history of the capital markets, but junk bonds, high yield bonds were really introduced and created and brought to the masses because of one guy, Michael Milken. And uh, a very interesting guy, and I won't get into his history and the issues around him. Very brilliant guy though. But that area of the market of providing financing to non-high-grade to, to, to non quality companies uh, really changed, was a game changer in the capital markets. And it brought investment down to those types of companies that prior to that was very expensive. So that's, uh, uh, that was uh, democratization of the high yield space. It's been going on a little bit in the venture capital space, but the, but the regulatory bodies have been, have been a little bit hesitant on that because they don't want people sold snake oil, so you have to be a credited investor, which means you have to have a net worth of a million bucks and stuff like that, before you can be sold on some of these uh, uh, venture capital type things. There is a movement afoot, however, that you should be aware of, if you're looking at that, where they're trying to lower that to allow people and set up a physical structure to where for as little as $2,500 people can get involved in the venture capital business as far as an investor. Now that could be a fairly significant game changer to be real honest and I don't know whether it's going to happen but given the economic situations that are going on right now and the desire it is to create jobs stimulating it from that level as far as uh, what's going on in the economy would be a very good thing to do. So anyway, just an interesting sidebar on that. Uh, <clears throat> involved in, uh, you know, there, there is the intellectual capital that you're learning here as far as how to manage the process of going through that. One thing that is key to, you know, there's a couple of key pieces as I view it and as I've been involved in, to, in, in this idea of, uh, uh, of entrepreneurship and creation of companies. First off is you don't have to create your own company to be innovative. I mean, there's going to be a lot of innovation come out of everywhere. And uh, innovation is a key driver of, of, uh, of new business startups and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, you always need to remember that your competition is also existing companies that are, that are innovating as well. <clears throat> and innovation is often always tied to the, uh, you know, to, to, to venture capital and entrepreneurship. Um, when, you, when we look at that, because now we consider ourselves actually one of our values, one of, the, one of the principles we stand behind, is that we want to be an innovative company. Uh, and in order to be innovative, there, there can be a lot of knockoff type things where you just take a particular thing and you do something slightly differently. An example of that, <clears throat> that I've seen just recently, I was, uh, I was in a meeting where someone was presenting an investment opportunity in a private company here locally, in, based out of Salt Lake City, called the, uh, the Deal Pickle. It's a name knockoff from the real, uh, well, uh, from Dill Pickle, but it's Deal Pickle, okay. Where they come up with these names, I don't know. <laughs> but that, 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 that's kind of what it is, but it's a direct competitor to Groupon is what they're doing. So it's, it's really, this is, this is not new innovation, but they've taken a concept and they're altering it. And the, the altering it is twofold. One is, is that they're doing it in the form of gift certificates. The idea being behind that is, is that they can take these gifts, is that people would buy these discounted services and then they can just give it and it comes out in a nice gift certificate form and stuff like that and give it to people rather than it just being for their own personal consumption. A couple of reasons behind that which I won't get into, but that's one of the concepts. And the other concept behind it is the fact that they can control better the flow into the private business. How many of you uh, have gotten Groupon stuff? I mean, you, do you guys know what Groupon is, pretty much? I mean, you guys would know better than me because you're the young generation, right? So <clears throat> uh, anyway, one of the problems with the Groupon model is, is that if you're a business and you put that out there, uh, like a restaurant, you got a 50% off coupon that they're going to get, uh, you're not sure what's going to happen. <laughs> you could have 500 people show up on your doorstep tomorrow, and, 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 and so there's not much control on the flow. With this one, you know, an innovation that they have made on that is that there's a way to control that. Plus, it's not just pushed to people and it's over in a day. Their model is, is that the company will come in and provide so many 
And then what they will do is they will work with the company on how many they will allow to be released over time. The advantage to the consumer on that is, is, is that it doesn't go away immediately. Now, the immediacy of it going away does drive some traffic because you're going to lose the deal, right? So you want to get in on it. <clears throat> but the advantage of this other one from their point of view is, is that you go in and there's several different coupons on the site that are there and you can go back and, and, and do it. Plus, they do email pushes to get people interested in it. So that's kind of, a, that's kind of an iteration. And then they're all, then they're all off. Uh, they're also what I would call game changers and uh, new technology that is just really different. Another group that I just listened to, uh, Research Insight, uh, based uh, based here in Salt Lake too, is a group that uh, is in. It's real interesting. It's a guy that's got a PhD in physics <clears throat> that created a logarithms in order to detect subtle differences in brain waves, and he was using this in the medical profession. And uh, then he had an epiphany. And he's taking this and he says, if there's some place that you're looking at waves, <clears throat> what about oil and gas exploration? Because you're doing this seismic 3D on all this property to try to find out where the oil is. And so he's actually developed uh, the, uh, he's, he's refined the, he's adjusted and refined the logarithms to look at these. And so between the boreholes that have already put down, been put down there and the information on those boreholes, plus the seismic 3D, he's used the same technology there, and he's improved the hit rate on well drilling from 30% to 80%. That's, a, that, that's kind of a, that's potentially a game changer. Now, it's done that in theory so far. In the next two years, we'll find out if it really, if it really works. So those are, those are real game changers. So there's a lot of different ways to do that. And from our view, we try to keep that entrepreneurial spirit within our company and we have created new innovations in the, in particularly in the 401k space that have been duplicated, some have been duplicated, some have not, where we've really been able to add value. So I think for this type of, uh, uh, th th this type of a uh, uh, enterprise or this type of an occupation, it helps if you're a little bit ADD. And uh, because you need to be able to kind of be free flow and free thinking and stuff like that when you're dealing with the startup end of the phase. We're looking for people that are a little bit that way, and I've worked with the venture capital industry enough to know that a lot of them are. And I do that kind of metaphorically, ADD. But it really is kind of true. And that's one of the transitions, and you're probably aware of this as you're going through there. One of the things that we pay particularly close attention to as we look at, um, as we look at investing in venture capital funds as opposed to a venture capital deal is what is the transition of management going to be? Because a lot of times the people that can create the ideas are not going to be good at, at, at building the company and executing and, and turning it into a larger company, uh, i.e., this guy that uh, uh, is at Seismic Insights. <clears throat> We've actually decided to do a small investment with them, but we won't do it for an equity position in the company because we don't believe that he can actually transition the company, so we're doing it on a royalty basis. So we're just going to take some of the oil. <laughs> and. Uh, We'll be, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy with that rather than uh, an equity position in the company. So anyway, kind of interesting. Some other things that are kind of going on, there's some different models out there. You guys are all familiar with angel groups. Uh, there's an interesting group here that uh, uh, has started up about a year ago and that I think is going to be very valuable to uh, the entrepreneur uh, community. It's called Maverick Angels. Uh, it's, it's started in Southern California. It's got a chapter here now in Utah. It's got another chapter that they just established over in Italy. And, you know, it's, they, they have a motto that, uh, you know, capital is not scarce, but ideas are scarce. Now, if you talk to people that have tried to raise money for a venture capital deal, they, would, they might argue that <laughs> statement because capital can be very difficult to raise. But this is a new model that is going to be very, that, that I am actually pretty excited about because it's kind of a vetting process. And uh, if anybody wants to contact the group, you can talk to me after because I can give you some contact information. But what, the way it works right now is it's really, it's really centered on the upfront part. And it usually deals with companies that, well, it deals with a spectrum of companies, some that are just an idea. Uh, both of these deals that I talked to you about have gone through this process with Maverick Angels. And what, they're basically, uh, what they basically do is they, they help the venture capital, or excuse me, they help the entrepreneur that's trying to raise capital, refine their pitch, 
so that it's very consumable for angel investors and also there's a couple of venture capital groups uh, uh, that, that go to these meetings as well. And it's really used as a vetting process. They have a boot camp, the entrepreneurs go to that, they learn how to make these, uh, and they really teach them how to get the point across. Because this idea, I, I was talking to a communications class earlier this morning, communications is really important because all of our time is valuable and we live in an era of information overload. The ability to be able to communicate that idea succinctly and what the opportunities are, why it's different, where it's positioned, and how that's and, and how that is uh, and how it's potential to grow all of those things that are going to be important to an investor in that in that space it all comes out in this and it's done in a way that's methodical and clear and only takes 10 minutes because when you're dealing with people I mean we get contacted hundreds of times about different opportunities like this we can't vet them all so the thing that's really nice about this is they've gone through a professional group has really taught them to hone it down, uh, hone it, get it down to a, a consumable part for us, people like us. We can look at it, we can understand it, and we can decide after that, uh, after that group meeting where they've made usually three or four presentations, just 10 minutes each, whether we want to pursue stronger due diligence. The other thing that's kind of nice is we as investors all stay in the room after we dismiss the entrepreneurs, and then we talk about the strengths and weaknesses. The other positive, though, is it's trying to really build the capabilities of the entrepreneur community because we all provide direct feedback on what was good and bad about the presentations. Uh, and uh, there have been several companies that have gotten funding uh, out of this process, and it's just, it's just six or eight months old. So it's, uh, so it's a pretty interesting deal. So if you're interested in that end of the entrepreneurship game, then that's something you might want to take a look at. Now. Are there any questions on anything I've talked about so far? Because I'm going to talk a little bit about my company and the innovation there, which may not be as directly related to what you want to hear from me or not. Anything on it? OK. Yeah. So maybe I missed, but what capacity are you in the venture capital? With? Is this has anything to do with the Deseret that you're working with? or? Yeah, that pool of assets that I talked about, that's our primary. That's the, the one that, the, the, the $3 billion piece, we have $3 billion in the defined benefit pool. That's just a broad uh, set of assets with a very long-term time horizon where we can take illiquid investments in it. You know, another couple of billion is in 401k plans. Can't do anything there. But in this one, we have, we have a broad array of investments, and one bucket that we have is what we call alternative asset class slash other. And in that one, it's just whatever doesn't fit into, you know, the domestic equity, foreign equity, blah, blah, blah. And uh, in that, we have, uh, we, we have a significant number of investments in venture capital. And that's, and that's the space we do. And that's, that's very typical of institutional type portfolios. Most endowment funds have significant exposure there, and uh, we do. Venture capital is treated a little bit different from our perspective, well, from the investor's perspective. Of the private equity areas, it's usually the one that has the least money allocated to it. And part of that, I think, is just perception. Typical venture capital deal, it's sobering, but it's true. Typical venture capital deal, if it's a successful venture capital fund, will invest in may maybe 20 or 30 companies. And of those, you know, uh, you know maybe a third of them are going to go to zero. And then uh, you'll have you know, a few real winners, and then the others will kind of muddle through. And so you're really, the hit rate is really pretty small on the ones that are really, the, the, the gold mines that you really want to hit. So from an institutional stand, investor's standpoint, that's one of the reasons why we use venture capital funds is because we're going to get the diversification across there. And one thing that we're looking for with the venture capital funds <clears throat> is we're looking for people that can add value. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, you know, if we're going to invest in the public markets, what we're looking for in a management team in the public markets is someone who can look at valuation levels in equities, as an example, if it's in equities, and add value at the margin so that they can outperform the market by a little bit. In venture capital, we're really looking for a different set of skills in our venture capital, in our venture capital general partners. We're looking for people that actually can bring something to the table to help this company succeed. 
And that can be a lot of different things. It can be help with bringing in professional management because a lot, as I, as I mentioned, a lot of early startup type companies, you've got a guy, you know, somebody with a great idea and, and, and uh, you know, maybe working out and stuff like that. But then just how do you, how do you grow it and spread it and all those things that, that, that you're learning about here. A lot of times they don't have either the contacts, might not even have the knowledge base or the temperament, any of those, to be able to accomplish that. And so what we're looking for when we're looking for a venture capital uh, a general partnership is we're looking for people that have the contacts and the, and, and the moxie, the intellectual capital to be able to facilitate that process. So as an institutional investor, those are the types of, you know, we kind of do it indirectly almost all the time, and it's through a venture capital partnership. So most of the syndic like syndicate, or do you have them take care of all the deal? They take care of all of the deal flow. And so, for, and, and we look for, for groups in different areas, uh, you know, depending, you know, on what they do. Like, there is a, there, there's a group here locally, um, uh, and it was interesting, uh, it's, um, um, Greg Warnock is the main guy. He teaches entrepreneurship Mercado. down at Mercado. Mercado. Yeah, that's it. I'm trying to think of the other. Who's in it besides Greg Warnock? Alan, Alan, Hall. Alan Hall. That's the name I was trying to get. Okay, if you look at if you look at Mercado, I mean Greg Warnock is 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 great. He's a bit of a maverick, <laughs> and it, literally, <laughs> great guy. He's actually a personal friend. He's uh, going to be up at the Spud Man with. Kyle, my son-in-law back there, and me doing the Spud Man up in Burley, the triathlon this summer. Uh, super guy and stuff, uh, uh, but uh, I keep thinking it's Paul Allen. It's Allen Hall. Uh, he has, because of this organization that he built uh, uh, in Ogden, he has a tremendous ability to connect into distribution. And uh, so he brings something that is very valuable to the companies that they bring up through this. So that's what we're looking for as differentiators because if you want to look at distribution of a product, you know, he can get them into, in, into a lot of places that they normally can't get into. And if you look at their first fund, it was very successful because of a couple of companies. Skullcandy, you know, that company was one of them. Yeah. And, and so uh, he's, uh, I mean, there is a real advantage. Plus, I have a lot of respect for Greg Warnock, too. He's, uh, uh, you know, he's very good. So and a very good open thinker. Uh, but the distribution channels is where the real value is likely to be added. Uh, other people, it's, it's, it's uh, the ability to bring in talent at, at um, you know, CFO levels, strategic thinking, all of those type things. But we're actually looking for differentiators. And so, you know, one of the things that we do that's a little bit different than other people is, you know, on private equity, most people have most of their money allocated to, uh, uh, to buyout funds. And we actually are the opposite of most people. We have more to venture capital because we think there is more that can be added in that arena f than, uh, than, than can be added in buyout funds. And so, you know, that's kind of the way we, <clears throat> that's how we access venture capital typically. And that's how, uh, and, and that's why, and, and why we do it the way we do it. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Yeah. Well, when somebody comes to present to you, um, you're in a group of how many guys uh, do they present to? This is the Maverick Angels group uh, that I was talking about before. Because yeah. if it's, and I'm just differentiating because we typically will invest in a fund, a, a, a limited partnership where there's general partners, and that's always, that's always done one on one, and they do the vetting process, all the companies. This Maverick Angels group is trying to bring it down to a different scale. I'm very fascinated by it. I think this could be kind of a bit of an industry changer, and especially on the low end, you know, in the smaller startup companies. Uh, but what they do is uh, <clears throat> they will go to what's called a, a boot camp where the entrepreneur is trained to distill this down because they only give them 10 minutes to make their pitch. And so they're, they're taught how to do that, and then the, the uh, principals at Maverick, uh, at Maverick Angels will actually do a vetting process there. If they don't think someone, if they don't think an idea is, is uh, worth the time of the investors, then they would just won't let them present in the meeting. So there's a vet, bit of a vetting process there. And then the other thing is, is they want to make sure that our time is not wasted. So they really get it down to where we can really understand what the drivers are of this, what the real important pieces are, 
so that we can kind of make a very quick decision, yay or nay. And then the people that are in the, uh, the, the, the people that are in the audience, <laughs> for lack of a better term, there is a lot of investors in the audience. There are some other entrepreneurs, and there are people that have uh, that are entrepreneurs that have been successful that actually are brought in as just for their expertise. So, if they know they're going to have a healthcare person in there, they will typically have someone who's been involved in you know in, in ventures in healthcare in there too, so that they can understand some of the issues around it. So, the, and the way it works, they got ten minutes to present, ten minutes of Q and A. And uh, they're done. The next one, the next one, there's usually three or four that come in. So, you know, in an hour or two, you get through a lot of, inf a lot of very good information presented well very quickly. And then what happens from there is, is that, uh, you know, people, uh, the, the investors will actually vote on some that they may be interested in. And then they can do it as a group. They can start doing the deal, deal, due diligence process rather than as a one-off investor. So it really stream. It, it really makes the process more effective, and um, uh, and much more productive. So it's 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 kind of interesting. Then if you tie onto that, if they get this other piece in there where they can get the minimums down, for other people can invest in it, it you know may break it might break free more capital even to lower level, which would be really nice. So, yeah, Dave. Yeah, when, you, when you say smaller business, give, give us the size of the investment. Most of these that are, that are presenting in this uh, in this arena are anywhere for, are usually a million to three million is what the capital raise they're looking at. So this is kind of on the smaller end. And the people that are looking to invest in it, the angels. I mean, you all go, you all know the term angel investors are the private individuals. They're typically looking for a twenty-five to fifty thousand dollar investment because they're diversifying their portfolio as well. So that's the that, that's a typical size for an angel investor in this. In, in, in this community. Now, other people will come in at a higher level. There's a, there's a, there was an interesting company that presented, and uh, sorry for my lack of uh, uh, technological prowess, <laughs> but what are those two games on Facebook? One's dealing with farming and one's dealing with a village or something. Just Farmville, I don't know what the other one is. Farmville and one other one. You know that alternate reality thing where you build this thing? You know, here's a concept for you. And, and I laughed at this at first because I says, there's no way this is going to work. And, and, then when, and then after I, I actually went into the due diligence, was just helping out on the due diligence process because we weren't going to invest in it, but they wanted me to help out on the due diligence process. But, so here it is. It's going to create one of these communities on Facebook. So it's a Facebook game. And, but here's the twist to it is, is that you're going to do the same thing that these others do. You build this virtual community, right? Okay, but the virtual community is going to be your ancestors, okay? That's the, that's the different part of it. Okay, now, that was, what, that was all I heard when I first started on this, okay? So immediately in my mind, this is where I go, okay? Because I don't, I don't do Facebook games. I don't do video games anymore either. But so I'm going, okay, I have a son who does video games over here. I have a wife who does genealogy over here. And these guys are on different planets. They will never even talk to each other about something like that. I mean, you know, so you're trying to put these two things together. That's the craziest idea I've ever heard, right? I mean, doesn't that sound stupid? I mean, that was my first impression. This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But then I got looking at the people that had funded it, and I thought, these aren't stupid people, okay, because uh, Jim Sorensen, you guys all know who Jim Sorensen is? Okay, uh, Jim Sorensen is one that funded it. Paul Allen was the guy, the guy that built Ancestry.com. I can see a connection there, okay. But a couple other uh, uh, Pretty good people have, have uh, been involved in this, and they're looking for a three million raise right now. And uh, and so, <laughs> but I did go to the due diligence, and it was interesting because that was my first question to them. As I said, the demographics like this just don't look like they work. And then they pulled up a slide. They had done their homework, which was good to see. And they did the did the demographics, and the biggest demographic group that uses these Facebook games, women, thirty five to fifty five. I was totally blown away. I had no clue, okay? But, uh, uh, but, it, but, but anyway, so I thought, well, maybe it's not a dumb idea after all. So I was, uh, I was brought down to that. But that's the types of deals that come through these. Th through these. Now, they're looking for it a little bit different. They want to go, they want one investor. So actually, this Maverick Angels group isn't a great fit for them because the, there aren't very many people in there who haven't already invested in it that would plop down $3 million at one for one idea. 
So anyway, that's kind of that's kind of the size of deal that they're dealing that they're dealing with. Other questions? Yeah. yeah Yeah, it comes down to that. You know, if you look at if you if you look at small business startups in the U.S., you know, I don't even want to tell you this, but the odds of success are really limited. <laughs> I mean, most small businesses fail, and uh, it, even if it's a pretty good idea, it can fail. There's a lot of things that can happen that can make a business fail. It can be bad management decisions. It can just be a bad product or a bad idea. It can be that you don't know that someone else, you know, over here had the same idea but a little bit better and has a little bit deli better delivery or distribution mechanism, something like There's a lot of reasons that that can happen. And, that, it, it, and it, is, it is a numbers game. I mean, if there's any place that you need diversification in the markets, venture capital is the place you need it the absolute most because the numbers are daunting. Because the ones that are the real winners are very few and you've got to have a few of those in your deal if you want a decent uh, rate of return on your capital. And uh, you know, like I said, there's 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 a few that are going to be home. There's gonna, you're, you're hope you're hopeful that you have a couple out of thirty that are home runs. You'll have uh, you'll have a, a a decent chunk that are kind of they get by, but you don't really make significant. You don't really make much money on them. And then you've got a bunch that just uh, that that just don't work out. And so that's the, that that's the reason why the venture capital groups. I mean, they've they've dominated the the venture capital partnerships have dominated the the capital raising this year. You've got the angels, but the venture capital groups, partnerships are the ones that have really dominated the space the most uh, uh, as far as raising, as far as capital raised in the venture, in the venture capital arena. And uh, like I said, you know, the, the, the other thing that's interesting, I mean, here's another interesting characteristics, but it's kind of comes back to this philosophy as to why we're looking for differentiators on these <clears throat> venture capital groups that are going to manage that space for us. First off, as an entrepreneur, be careful. <laughs> Check these people out because a venture capitalist is in it for one reason, and that's their carried interest on the back end because they're going to make 20% of the, uh, of the profits that are made on this, and they're just looking for make as much money as I can, get to, an, get to, a, get to a distribution, some type of distribution, some type of an exit strategy, and, and get me out of here. And quite frankly, most of them won't care about you as the CEO. Uh, they'll ride you hard because they're in it. T -t -t -t. And, and part of that's good, but they also bring a lot of resources too. But they also like to have a lot of control in the deal. So if you talk to people that have been serial entrepreneurs, it's, it's, they, they, they like that because they can get the capital. It limits their degrees of freedom. Uh, and so they actually oftentimes like angel investors uh, uh, better, but angel investors you have you know, you have less capital available. So, but that's the reason why you want diversification. That's why an, reason an angel investor will want diversification too. As great as the idea may sound, you just don't know. So, other yeah. So if you're past the startup phase and you're in revenue, um, and you're kind of you're running into cash problems, where 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 are some of the best places, the best resources? Still, there are, there are venture capital places that deal specifically with that, and it would be venture capital partnerships again. Yeah, and again, they will extract something. I mean, <laughs> there, but uh, but there there are venture capital groups out there that deal specifically with that. You know, you find them all over. You've got the early stage people that that just that, that are really dealing with things in a conceptual stage, and then there's those that, that there's there's those that specializes in places like the one that I'm talking about with Greg Warnock and stuff like that. They're not really interested. Although they'll do one once in a while. They did one in this second round of financing that they raised. They'll sometimes do something that's just kind of a concept. If they do that, it's because they have had uh, experience with that group in the past, and they're willing to bet on that management team, that group, <clears throat> which is the case in this one that that that, that uh, Mercado just did. Uh, but Mercado is really one that wants to take something that is it's an existing business, it's generating revenue. But it needs to grow, and then it's so 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 they're growth-oriented venture capital firms, and uh, uh, and there's a bunch of those around. Mercado being one of them, and so they're there. They 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 want the product out of the ground and being sold. And what they're going to do is they're going to build out the distribution channels so that you can increase your revenues quickly, 
and that would be you know one that would fall into that category. But there's a bunch of them. And then there's some that are late stage that it's just get me prepared right before the IPO or the you know to to, to prepare the company in the final stages right before uh, right before the exit strategy. Whether that's an IPO or a merger. So good question. Other questions? Yes. What usually happens to the entrepreneur that may be limited in its experience when he goes to these VCs? Like, if they bring in new management, is he just, do they take him along and help train him and stuff like that, or is he just kind of out? Uh, well, they, they won't come in with the idea of kicking you out, typically. <laughs> But what happens is, is there is a, there is a critical phase where, and entrepreneurs do have a habit, oftentimes, of being so close to the, so close to the idea, so bought in and so close to the idea and stuff like that, that sometimes they have a hard time opening their mind to other possibilities for it and other things, and sometimes they just don't have the tech, technical competence to build it out. And uh, so they're, they're, I, I don't want to give the misimpression that they're coming in there as hatchet men to try to get rid of management. They're not. But you got to understand that venture capital groups like that are focused on their ROR. That's what they're focused on. And so they will just make a cold, hard evaluation. Are you capable of taking this to the next level? <clears throat> and if you're not, they will, they will try to remove you out and get in somebody that, that, that will. And they're not interested necessarily. Most of them will not be interested in training you. It's, 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 it's pretty cold and hard to, to a large extent. And I, I'm making that sound bad. It's not bad, okay? It's just a business. It's, it's, it's a business decision. But you just always have to remember that what they're in the business of is they've got, they've got limited partners like myself that are going to look at them and evaluate them on how they have done on their rate of return. And we want that taken care of. If they think they can develop you into something that would be great, they, will, they, they would do that, you know? But they're, de but they're dealing with uh, their, as opposed to a public company which releases its quarterlies, you know, uh, once a quarter and you get that information along with everybody else out there, people that are in the venture capital business are looking at the sales reports weekly, the, cap the venture capital general partners are looking at their sales reports weekly. And if they're not going the way they like, you know, they're, they're, they're pressing them. So, it's, uh, it's, so that's, the, that's the type of damage you deal with there. Yeah. So it sounds like even as an LP, you have a pretty active role in <clears throat> fund. Are you, or it sounds like you've been in a lot of the deal screening processes with. with well, let me let me. I, I've I've miscommunicated. Okay, there are two pieces in the venture capital partnerships where we're a limited partnership. By definition, we can't legally even get involved. Otherwise, we lose our limited partnership status. Okay, okay so in that. While we will talk to some of the companies and we'll see how they're doing and stuff like that, to be honest, that's as much marketing from the general partners because they're going to raise another fund a year or two down the road as it is anything else. But we, we are very limited in that. We do sit on advisory boards and some of those advisory boards so we can give input and those type of things. But the general partners are free to go and do whatever deal they want and in whatever capacity they want. This Maverick Angel deal that I talk, we've become involved in that, I'll be honest, Here's my shot of entrepreneurship. I started a regi I've started an investment advisory firm that manages money using a technology that we've developed at, at Desert Mutual. That Desert Mutual is a closed shop, so it's never going anywhere out, and we've decided to take it out. So we're in the process. That's how I got involved with Maverick Angels, because we typically will not do a one-off deal, uh, and most institutional investors are not will not. When we do do something like that, it would be what's called a side agreement, uh, where if there was some business that one of our general partners really liked and they didn't want to fund the whole thing, they could say, well, do you want a little bit of slice of this and, you know, and, and we'll let you invest directly. A lot of institutional investors kind of like, like that. It kind of lets them hone their, 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 their skills and view of things. And then it gets uh, the, the biggest problem with the venture capital community from an institutional investor standpoint is the cost. While we're looking for people that can make a lot of difference in helping build these companies, the cost is onerous. It's 2% management fee plus 20% of the profits. So that's, you know, they've got to make, they've got to make a big difference in order for it to work out well for us. Yes. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm in the pro. Yeah, I started a company with the process of trying to build it out. Six months, I'll tell you whether we're gonna. <laughs> we'll know in six months whether that was a good idea or not. <laughs> but okay, so the question is, how do I get involved with Desert Mutual? And then, did you have something to follow up on? How do you get involved with the uh, venture capitalists and what you're doing now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, I, I got involved in Desert Mutual just quick on on my background. I graduated from Utah State, as you know, Tim mentioned with an MBA, I, I actually was going to go do a PhD. I love the capital markets and economics. That's what my background is. Uh, and, uh, but things changed, <laughs> and I won't go into that long story. But I ended up being a portfolio manager for the church's ecclesiastical reserves depart, uh, investment department. <laughs> and then after three years, they asked me to start the investment department at Desert Mutual. And I've been there ever since. I have a very unusual career. Uh, it's rare that someone gets somewhere like that and stays. I thought I was going to be there five years and move on and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And I've had, you know, some significant opportunities, but I really like the organization that I deal with. And uh, they give me a lot of latitude. That's one of the things with entrepreneurs. People, some people are destined to be entrepreneurs because you have a hard time listening to other people taking direction. Moi. <laughs> but it just so happens that in the organization that I'm in, that, uh, that they've given me a lot of degrees of freedom. And so we've been able to do some very interesting things, been very creative, very innovative. Uh, uh, Aon Consulting actually uh, a few years ago in a national publication called us the crown jewel of benefits uh, administrators in the country. And uh, so very proud of some of the things that we've been able to do and I've had the ability to be a part of helping to develop that. And because of that, that's why I'm still there. But that's how I got to Desert Mutual. Uh, I, I've always had a love for the uh, capital markets and, uh, and economics. And I can't get rid of my economics. I really love economics. <clears throat> but and I think it's also helpful in viewing the, ca the capital markets. So, um, uh, so that's how I got there. As far as us getting involved in venture capital, we were looking for areas. W we look for areas where there's inefficiencies. Uh, and uh, one of the areas where there's a great deal, of, two, two areas where there's a lot of inefficiencies are real estate because you're dealing with, you're not dealing with a homogeneous asset class there. Everything's all over the place. Uh, uh, but also in venture capital to a large extent too. And that that's, comes back to that philosophy. Why do we have more venture capital in our group than what a typical investor does? Most people sh shy away from it more because it's a little scarier and the returns are, can, can be involatile. And you can look like a schmuck, to be real honest. I mean, if you invest in venture capital partnerships, it's like venture capital itself. Eventually, you're going to get involved in a group that you wished you hadn't gotten involved in that venture capital partnership because it's, it's just going to be bad. And that happened a lot in the, uh, back, in the, uh, uh, back in the late 1900s, 1999, 1998, 1999 vintage years and stuff like that, right before... The tech bubble crashed. That was a terrible time when people, you know, the 98, 99 vintage years, because they were investing their money at just a horrible time. <laughs> and so those look terrible. And then just because, the, just because of the law of numbers, sometimes even if it's a good venture capital general partnership team, and, and that sometimes they're just going to miss and stuff. But interesting, the evidence, you know, some of the evidence that we use on this, and the reason why we have, why we personally have a little more confidence in the venture capital areas. If you, look at, uh, if you look at sustainability of excess performance, in other words, the sustainability of success, if you look at it for people that manage money in the public markets, it's all over the map, you know? And, uh, and there's long periods of underperformance and long periods of outperformance. And we think we can win at that game too, but if you look at, but, but if you look at persistency of performance, the one place that you can get it the most, actually, is in the venture capital community. And I think it's a combination of two things. One is, 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 that, the, is that the venture capital, like a Kleiner Perkins, which is one of the famous ones, okay? <clears throat> a, it's got very good people that really bring something to the party that help these businesses to be able to grow. But the other thing they have is once they've had success, they, they get a better look at the deal flow and kind of first call on that stuff. So it's kind of success breeds success in a way. But the part that we're the most interested in is that there is a persistency because we believe in certain people 
can bring things to the table that these companies know. So again, I hate to use Mercado as, as the example all the time, but <clears throat> there is a particular person in there that really brings value to certain types of companies, which is the types of companies that they specialize in. And there's others. There's one that's in the telecommunications industry that has incredible relationships with, uh, with, with the group that does the bandwidth stuff. I can't even remember who is it, the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, yeah, and stuff like that. Well, their specialty is finding ways to create, is to create and change the use of bandwidth. Think of real estate and creating better and uh, better use for the property, only it's in bandwidth. And these guys are really good at this and have very good contacts to be able to get it accomplished. So, yeah. so that's a group that we go through and say, wow, these guys, you know, have a sustainable advantage that they have that will lead to better success. So, uh, you know, that's where, you know, we're looking for things where people can make a difference and that's one way that we, that, that's one place that we view that you can. Long-winded answer to a good question. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Just kind of to clarify, you're not a venture capitalist, but you invest in venture capitalists and firms? You, you, predominantly, yes. It doesn't mean we wouldn't do an off deal once in a while. But yeah, we're not, we're not, we would not go out and, it would be very rare for us to go out and fund a company on its own. We would use this, this structure of the deal. Okay. All right. Thanks. Good to be with you.